Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, saints. Bless the Lord one more time. You know, it's a privilege to be with you another evening, you know, to do Bible study. Um, we have been talking about identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil. You know, tonight I want to greet you all. I'll greet you in Jesus' name. Whether you're near or far, you're in Jamaica, you're somewhere else in the world, I take this time out to greet you today in the name of Jesus Christ. The name that the Bible says is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So before we go any further, um, just bow your heads while I pray before we get in the word of the Lord. Lord, we want to thank you today for your blessings. We want to thank you for your love and for your mercies. We want to thank you for this opportunity, God, to share in another word, Lord Jesus, that you would want your people to hear. We pray, God, that you will speak to hearts tonight, that you will speak to soul, that you will speak to spirit. And great God, that your perfect will be accomplished. At the end of the day, Lord Jesus, you are concerned about our soul. You are concerned about the entire man. And you want to save us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we will submit to your will. And that your will be accomplished in our lives. As we look to you, as we proceed in this lesson tonight, we ask that you have your own way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, again, we are dealing with identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil. You know, and I just want to draw attention again to a key verse. It's taken from Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, from about 10 down. And by now, probably you would have known it because we have read it almost every week. Right? Amen. So the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. So, we have been talking about <coughs> knowing ourselves and we have been asking the question, who do you say that I am? And, you know, there are varying answers that people give, you know, and I have seen the response. Some people call me and we talk and, you know, I am glad that the word of God is hitting home because it's important that we ask ourselves, but that we also answer the question, who am I? Right? That's very important. Who am I? And you know, we said some weeks ago that we are the sons of God, and we said that irrespective of we remain the sons of God. First things first, I am the son of God. But some of the points we touched on last week was who am I? And we said that I I am um, a friend of Jesus. Jesus said in St. John 15, verses 15, he said, I call you no more servants, but I call you friend, because I have told you everything that my father have told me. So we are no longer slaves, slave to sin, slave to works of the flesh, but we are a friend of Jesus. Who am I? I am a friend of Jesus. We also said that we have been blessed. Who am I? I am blessed with all spiritual blessing. You know, we said last week that some folks, when, if they do not see the physical blessing, they don't think that they are blessed. And sometimes the adversary will play on our mind, will play, play with us. And would cause us to think that because we don't see the material blessing, that we are not blessed. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, verses 3, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms in Christ. So I want, irrespective of what the adversary might be putting in your mind, and he might be telling you that you are not blessed, I want to dispel that myth tonight. I want to dispel that from your mind and will have you to understand that you being a child of God, you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. We said that you should not look at Tom June and you should not look at Mary Sue and look at what they have and the things that they possess because you being a child of God, you being filled with the Holy Ghost, you have a greater possession than they will ever have. And we made mention of the Lazarus and the rich man the rich man, he had it all in this life. But then when he died and Lazarus died, Lazarus went into paradise. The rich man was tormented. I want you to know that you have riches and toll in heaven. I want you to know that you are blessed with all spiritual gifts, all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And you can be content with that tonight, knowing that God knows your name, knowing that God remembers your number and that you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. Who are you? You are blessed with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Amen, child of God. And I want you to know that I want you can rest assured tonight that you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. We also made mention that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 through to 20, right, that I am, we are the temple of the living God. So this body that we said that this body that you're looking at, right, this body belongs to God. It is the temple of God. The Bible says, but he that is joined unto the Lord, is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. For he are bought with a price. So the Bible is telling us now that we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. What the scripture is telling us here is that we don't belong to ourselves anymore because Christ himself has paid a price for us. We are the temple of God and Christ himself has paid a price for us. Therefore, we are to glorify God in our body, right? And in our spirit, which belongs to God. First Peter 2 verse 5 says, You also as living stones are built up a spiritual host, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A temple is where worship and devotion takes place. And your temple, with your temple, there should be worship and devotion that is taking place going up to the Lord. You do not belong to your own, but you belong to the Lord. I, we also made mention that we are to be careful of the things that we do in our body. How is it that we treat the temple of God? And we made mention of some of the things that we partake in and, 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 and things that would destroy the temple of God. right? And we have to then bear in mind that the things that we eat, are important if we find ourselves eating the sugary things and eating the fatty stuff we have to recognize that that go against the temple of God the apostle in 1st John 2 15 to 17 right he tells us that we should love not the world nor the things of the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him 
for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And Paul, the apostle, in talking to the folks at Corinth, reminded them that this body that they dwell in belongs to God. It is the temple of God. And today, again, I am reminding us that this body is the temple of God. And we are to be careful as though we treat the temple of the Lord. I want you to know that the Lord look at you. He desires you more than how he desires 100 temple that is made with the hands of men. So he made you a special temple so that he could come and dwell in. And God is not looking for a building, but he wants you, he wants your soul to, to dwell in. So we must make sure that we keep our body away from things that will destroy it. If any man destroys, uh, if any man defile the temple of God, right, him shall God destroy. Who am I? I am the temple of God. We also made mention that first, second Corinthians 5, 20 to 21, right? And we said that we are, we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. And this is very important, right? And remember that we have been saying it's important that we identify who we are. Because when we identify who we are, then we are able to identify the enemy. We are able to easily identify the enemy. When we identify who we are, then there is that line that we mentioned that we would have drawn. And we know that anything over on the other side of that line is the enemy. And we want to make sure that we stay on this side of the line so that we might be able to fulfill the will of the Lord. Anything on the other side of the line, we identify that that is the enemy. And it's important that we know ourselves. So 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 21. Now then, we are amb ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we are the righteousness. We are the righteousness of God. And this righteousness that we have is not of ourselves, right? This righteousness is through Christ. So Christ became sin that you and I might become the righteousness of God. Without Christ's righteousness, we would not have any lot in our part with God. Remember, we talk about the scripture that tells us that our righteousness is but as filthy rags before the Lord. And this is not know that we are saved, but our righteousness, if it was self-righteousness, righteousness of our own will, then we would be as unrighteous before the Lord. But when Christ now looks at us, now that we are born again, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Who am I? I have become the righteousness of Christ. And this would not be possible to be the righteousness of Christ except that Christ died. Our righteousness, we said, cannot stand before the Lord. Who are you? I have become the righteousness of God. Who are you? Who am I? We also made mention that we are ambassadors of God. Again, if we look back at 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20, Paul said that we are ambassadors of the Lord. Being an ambassador of God, being an ambassador is an respected 
official acting as a representative of a nation sent to a foreign land, the ambassador role is to reflect the official position of the sovereign body that gave him his authority. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul likened his own calling to that of as ambassador. He urges us as Christians to consider ourselves as ambassadors for Christ. I want you to know this evening that you are an ambassador, an ambas ambassador of Christ, right? And you have got to be aware of this, that the, the ambassador, he represents, when he goes out, he represents the country that gave him his authority. As Christians, we represent the kingdom of heaven because that's where we get our authority from. So we are ambassadors, ambassadors of Christ. First Thessalonians 2 verses 4, as we go through this world, We represent another kingdom. We represent a heavenly kingdom. And it is our responsibility to reflect the official position of heaven. What is the official position of heaven? It is holiness. We said last week that the angels cry, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We also quote the scripture, follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which no man shall see God. The official position we put it forth to us of heaven, of that place that we represent, is holiness. Therefore, it means then that as ambassadors of Christ, we must live holy. And that can't be emphasized enough. Living holy. We are in the world. But we are not of the world. We are God's ambassadors. Empowered, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We must make and take the message of the king throughout the ends of the earth. We are ambassadors of God. And I could have said much more about who we are. I could have said some other things. But like I made mention that these were not so critical to what we are trying to get across. But we can also look at Acts 1 verse 8. And we can close off with this. Who am I? I am, an, um, I am a power pack individual. Acts 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in, Je and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So, who am I? I am power pack. And I tell you the truth, this enemy that we are dealing with, if we don't have power, we cannot deal with this enemy. Also, in Mark chapter 16, 17 to 18, talking about who am I? I am power pack. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they take, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want you to know that you are power pack. You have the Holy Ghost. You are power pack. You know, as I was in church on Sunday, you know, I look, the scripture was just going through my mind. And with all of the COVID, you know, you just wonder if, you know, but the Bible says that we should lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And know that we can also speak the word and see and people recover. But this is something that, the Bible tells us that we should do, lay our hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know, I believe that, I believe in the word of God. Let me say that. And if somebody, and I feel led in the spirit to lay my hands, I go and lay my hands on them. Hallelujah. I am following the scriptures. The devil would not want us to follow the scripture, you know. 
The devil would want when somebody come in the church and they say, pray for me. You, you, you steer from afar uh, and uh, but it's a principle that is in the scripture. And the Bible says that we should lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But you are power pack even if the person is sick and you lay hands on them. If you lay hands on the sick and the sick can recover, I believe that the power that is in you, the power that operates through the Holy Ghost, will not allow you to contract that sickness. Greater is he that is in you. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. I am not telling us to be arrogant. I'm saying that we am not telling us not to obey the protocols. But I'm saying that if the Holy Ghost bids us and says, look here, lay your hands. I'd rather to follow the Holy Ghost. I rather to follow the Holy Spirit. First John 4, verses 4, and today we'll be reading a couple of scriptures. We'll be reading a couple of scriptures as well. So in 1 John 4, verses 4, who am I? I am poor Pak. The Bible says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I want you to know, child of God, that the only way we are able to overcome the world and what is in the world, it is because greater is he that is in us. I want you to know that you are poor pack. I want you to know that within you, God has invested in you. He has deposited in you power for you to overcome the schemes, for you to overcome whatever the adversary throws at you. Mind you, we have to rely on the strength of the Lord, which is what we mentioned in, in, in our second week, that we have to rely, we have to rely on the strength of the Lord if we are going to overcome. But God has equipped you. He has empowered you to live a life that is victorious. He has empowered you to overcome. Who am I? I am poor. Pack. I have power in me. So it is important that we know who we are because it is, it is in knowing who we are that we will be able to easily identify the enemy even when the enemy disguise himself and come as an angel of light even when he disguise himself to be our friends and to seem as if he's with us we if we know ourselves then we will be able to identify the enemy so we want to look tonight at knowing the enemy knowing who the enemy is and if we go back to our key verse, key chapter, verse, and we look at verse 12. It tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'll, I'll read it a second time for the emphasis. Like we have been saying, 
there is an enemy. And this enemy is not a fictitious enemy. This enemy is not something that we conceptualize as ministers and we tell you that there is an enemy in order to drive fear in you so that you can serve the God that we are serving. No. The Bible tells us that there is an enemy and the fact that we as children of God have experienced God in a personal way. We have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know that God is real. And if God is real, then we know that the enemy is real. I can tell you of a fact that God is real. We said it, who am I? I am definitely changed. I'm a changed individual. The life that I'm living now, know that I am in contact with God, know that I've come to know Him, is a different life that, than I used to live. So now I am sure that there is an enemy and that he wants to destroy my soul. There is an enemy, a real enemy, and he wants to destroy your soul. I want to tell you this, that he is interested in your worship because this enemy knows that if you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping him. He knows that there is no middle road when it comes to God. And he is competing for your worship. And he will stop at nothing to get your worship. He will stop at nothing to trip you up. And then when you fall, he wants to hold you captive and keep you bound. This enemy is not something that we conceptualize and something that we talk of because we want to drive fear in your heart to get you to worship God, to get you to serve God. No, but this enemy is real. The Bible in many instances tells us of this enemy. And while it does not tell us everything, it tells us enough so that we can get a good idea of who this enemy is and how he operates. Oftentimes we read the scripture in the book of Ephesians chapter 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers. But somehow we really don't get the full, true understanding of who it is that we are up against. Tonight I really want to just take my time so that we can get a good understanding of who it is that we are up against. So that we can get a clear idea of this enemy and how he operates. Or should I say how they operate. A lot of time things happen. And we don't know the reason why they happen. Sometimes we just think. That it is just another happening. Not knowing that you are a target. When I say you are a target. I'm talking about the child of God. You are a target. The adversary is not so much concerned with those who are in sin. He is more concerned about those who are serving God because you are a threat to him. You can witness to somebody that is in sin and help them to come out of sin. You have the power to bind and to loose. So the adversary is more interested in you the adversary really wants your soul. He really wants you. And so once you are saying Jesus, there is a target, there is a bullseye on your back. And the adversary really wants to get you. So that neighbor that you think that is against you. A lot of times as Christians, we look at things at the physical. 
And when we pray, we pray about the individual, but not recognizing that the Bible is telling us that the real enemy is not the flesh and blood. Often time we think that it is the lecturer that just don't like us. I have news for you. There might be something in the lecturer, but there is no doubt that the adversary finds something in the lecturer that he can use against you. And don't feel a way he is going to use it against you. Any way he can get to break you. Hallelujah. He's going to try to break you. Any way he can get you bone, he's going to try to get you bone. Any way he's going to he, he, he's going to try to depress you. Bring on depression on you. Bring on oppression on you. Because he's trying to break you. He wants to destroy you. He means you no good. Once you have named the name of Jesus, there is a bull's eye on your back. And the devil is out to get you. So that neighbor or that lecturer or that supervisor at work, you think that that supervisor is operating just like that? You think that that supervisor is picking on you just like that? But I want to encourage you to stand your ground. I want to encourage you so that you might know how to channel your prayer. Because it is not a flesh and blood. It is happening because you are wrestling against principalities and against powers. So I want us to turn now in our Bibles to 1 Peter 5 verses 8. That neighbor, that lecturer, that supervisor, it is not just like that. There is an enemy that has targeted you for the simple reason of destroying your soul. 1 Peter 5 verses 8. Be sober. Glory. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And let me just pause here because as children of God, we need to understand how the lion operates. The lion as they prowls, they seek out the weak, they seek out the lame. And when they make their attack, they are going to attack the weak, the lame. And they often time they kill. It is no different with the devil. If your life as a child of God is not at the place where it is supposed to be and you are weak and you are lame, make no mistake about it because the adversary is coming at you. The Bible tells us, hallelujah, that we are to be sober and vigilant. Be vigilant there is telling us that we need to be watchful because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. Walk it about. Seeking whom he may devour. As a child of God, I'm telling you, if your life is not at the place that it is supposed to be, and you spiritually you are weak, then I want you to know that you have a spiritual adversary that is ready to attack you when you are at your weakest point. It therefore means... That as people of God, as much as possible, we have to try to maintain our walk with God. Make sure that our walk with God is at that place. Make sure that our spiritual life is at that place. And that we are not weaklings in Christ. Because 
The adversary is like a roaring lion and is seeking. I want to tell you this. That the adversary take time out to study you. He knows your habits. He knows your weaknesses. And he knows when you're not praying and when you're not fasting and when you're at your weakest point. And when he sees that you are at that point, that is the time he tries to step in. Have you ever been at that point where you just feel a little bit weak and feel far from God and you, you know that your life is not really at the place that it is, that it should be? And have you ever noticed that it's at that time that your mind is being bombarded with a whole lot of things? Have you ever realize that it's at that time when you are so weak spiritually that you find out that there are some things that would come to you that would not normally come to you as a strong Christian. When you are at that place with God, some things just wouldn't even come in your mind. But know that you know, you kind of slack off on the praying, slack off on the fasting, a month gone and you have not fasted. And you find that at your weakest point, the adversary, you know, some things just happen. Some things just come upon you and you're saying, why? Because the adversary knows that you're at your weakest point and that is the time that he tries to attack you. So the scripture said, be sober, be alert. Because there is a real danger beyond the physical. There is an adversary that desires to de devour us. Devour. From the same passage comes from the Greek word katapino, which means to draw or to swallow up. Mighty God. This enemy wants to swallow you up. This enemy wants to swallow me up. He wants to devour us until we have no identity. If we have no identity, we cannot know who the enemy is. If we have no identity, we will accept anything. Oh, glory. And this adversary, he wants to swallow up us. He wants to devour us. So there is a real enemy. But where did, did, did this enemy come from? And why is he targeting Christians? Where did this enemy come from? This God that we serve, Jesus Christ, is from everlasting to everlasting. Revelation 22, 13. And this is from everlasting past. To everlasting present. This God that we serve. His name is Jesus Christ. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. So everything begins with God. And everything ends with him. Everything revolves around him. Before him there was nothing made. And without him nothing was made. The book of Genesis talking about who the enemy is now starts with the creation of the world. And it, God is the creator of the world. Irrespective of what the Big Bang Theory said, God is the creator of the world. The psalmist tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The Hebrew word for Genesis means the book of beginnings. So before God said, 
let there be and things came into existence, there was just God. And when I think about it, God is all power, he is all powerful. But in order to get things in motion, he did something. One of the first things I believe that he did was that he created sound. Without sound, you cannot have words. The next thing I believe that he created was words. Without the words, there was no execution. There was no command that was given in order to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. So he created word. And if we look in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3, we recognize how important the word is. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And if we go right down through the creation story, we would recognize that almost all of the time, the Bible says, and God said, let there be. So there had to be word in order for the execution to take place. God spoke it. He said, let there be. And there was. So the spoken word he, he, was what he used to create the heaven and the earth. The next thing that I believe that was created were the angels. And this belief is based upon scriptures. If we turn to Job 38, 1 through to 7. I believe that before the creation of the world, of the universe, that the angels were created before that. If we look at Job 38, 1 to 7, Job was having now a conversation with the Lord. And the Lord was now talking back to Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counseled by my words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer, an answer to me. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth, declared, if thou hast understanding? Who had lay the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who had stretched out the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So here the Lord asks, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth and the morning stars sung together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Angels are referred to as morning stars. If we go in scriptures and do some research, we realize that angels are referred to as morning stars. And the sons of God, the term sons of God, are all, angels are also referred to as the sons of God. And they were witnesses to the creation of the world. They were witness to 
the molding and the farming of man. They were witness when God blew breath in man. So from the inception of time, angels were there. Under the sun, angels have seen it all. Very important for us to understand that the Bible in Job said that age, said that wisdom is with the age. Now I want you to understand that if wisdom is with the age, what the scripture is saying that the longer you live, the wiser you become because you would have seen more things and you would have learned from those things. No, these angels were around from the foundation of the earth, which means that they would have seen a whole lot of things, which means that they are wise. So if you think that you can outsmart the adversary, <laughs> you're making a sad mistake. If you think that you can outwit him, not going to work. He has been around. And he has seen many things, things that we have never seen. The Bible says that there is nothing new under the sun. For us, this corona thing is new. But the adversary have seen it all. So God, he created these angels. And the Bible made mention of them. There are some who believe that angels are organized into three hierarchies and nine others. We will not get into that tonight. However, we will list the angels that are mentioned in the Bible because it is important to the passage that we read, which says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So we, they always make mention of seraphim. Seraphims. They made mention of seraphim firstly. And they, their attendants are guardians before the throne of God. If we look at Isaiah 6, 1 to 3 and Revelation 4, 4 to 9, we would see where these scriptures talk about the seraphims. They are attendant, like I said. And they are guardians before the throne. They have six wings. And with two, they cover their feet. With two, they cover their faces. And with two, they fly around. And they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Again in Revelation 4 verses 4 to 9, it talks about the seraphims. And they praise God continuously, calling holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Amen. And when these bees give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who live it forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall long before him that sat on the throne and worship him that live it forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor, power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure they were created. So these seraphims, it was said 
of these seraphims that they were the only set of angels that did not fall because they were ministering around the throne of God. And it, it is always said that, you know, if we spend the time to minister to God, we spend the time to worship God, we spend the time to fast and to pray and to maintain a relationship with God, that we will not get distracted by the adversary. So these seraphims, they said that, you know, these were the only one that were not. So here is the scripture. We can look at the scripture. Look at that scripture. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, he each had six wings, with twain they covered their faces, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain they did fly. So, just to give you an idea of the seraphims, then the next we have the cherubs, the cherubims. Right, when we talk about cherub, we're talking about one. When we say cherubims, it's more than one. In scriptures, cherubims are mentioned more than 60 times. And offer in and this offer insight in your roles and activities. They are man-like in appearance. They are double winged. The first mention of cherub is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 24. So they are double winged and they look like they have features like a man. Genesis 3, verses 24. So, he drove out the man. This is saying that, this is what's after man's sin, you know. God drove out the man, drove out the man and drove out the woman. So, he drove them out and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims and a flaming sword which turned away, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I want you to know that even now there are people in search of the tree of life. But God placed cherubs with flaming swords, turn every side to keep away man from eating from the tree of life to live forever in sin. In Exodus 25, 18 to 19, the Bible also spoke about cherubims. The golden image of cherub are mentioned in the design of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. This reveals the importance of cherubs in the presence of God. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten wood, beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So if you look at the mercy seat, you see two cherubims with their wings almost meeting. And this was the cover for the Ark of the Covenant. Cherubs were also included in other aspects of the tabernacle design. And this is Exodus 26, 31. And later, when the temple was built, cherubs were also placed in the temple. If you look at Ezekiel 41. There is also what we call thrones. And for that we can look at Colossians 1 verses 16.
And at the same time, we can also look at dominions because Colossians 1 verse 16 make mention of both. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So the passage make mention of principalities. It made mention of powers. But it's also made mention of thrones and dominions. And if you continue to look in scripture that talk about principalities and power, principalities is always mentioned before powers. In Ephesians 1, verses 20 to 21. Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also which is to come. So, again, there is what we call thrones and then there is what we call dominion and these are angels. Then there is power. Powers are said to be warrior angels. If we look at Paul as he talks about what we wrestle again, against his principalities and powers. Right? Um, Colossians 1 verses 16 again talks about that. Ephesians 6 and 12 also talks about that. We don't even have to go to that scripture. That scripture is what we have been reading now for weeks. And then Ephesians 1 20 to 21 also talks about powers which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come so there is what we call principalities and these are angels. Sorry, that is power. And then there is what we call principalities now. Scriptures for that. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Ephesians 1, verses 2. And 6, verses 12. Colossians 1. Verses 16. In most places where the phrase appears, the context makes it clear that it is referring to a vast array of evil. Anyway, you say principalities and powers. It is the, the context of the, the passage always it, it's like it seems like there's just a vast array of evil, right, and malicious spirit making war against the people of God. Principalities and powers of Satan are usually viewed here being that they are unseen, but they are at work. And then there is what we call the arch angels. Only two places in scripture mention about the arch angel. And this is, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16. And then Jude 1 verses 9. 
1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The next passage is Jude 1, 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Just not bring against him railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. They are called the great heralds of good news, announcing the great and most glorious. They serve can, their service consists of revealing prophecies, knowledge, and understanding to the will of God. Then there is what we call angels, which I say, you know, is just the regular angels. Right? Scriptures for this, again, is Psalms 34, verses 7. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and deliver them. Then there is Psalms 91, 10 to 12. Fear shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And then even in Daniel's encounter, Daniel was in the lion's den. And the Bible said that an angel came. Daniel was now giving his account to the king. And Daniel said to the king, the Lord send that angel. And the angel closed the mouth of the lions. So these angels were servants of the Most High God. But in the midst of all the glory, in the midst of all the worship, there was evil found in one. So I want us now to turn to two portions of scripture. First of all, Ezekiel 28, 14 to 15, and then Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. So while in heaven, while in heaven, while being in the presence of God, all these angels... If you can just bring your mind to the point where you can just see a host where God is and these hosts were just worshipping him. The orchestra was there in heaven. But then in one, there was sin. Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that Cover it. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire. This is in the literal no presence of God, you know. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So in the midst of all that was happening, 
evil was found in one. And then let us look at Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So this morning star, this son of the dawn, Satan got corrupted and said that I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In the midst of all goodness, in the midst of all purity, in the midst of worship like we have never seen before, and glory, evil was found in him. Not only that, he caused one third of the host of heaven to fall with him. Like I said, only the seraphims did not fall with him. But he caused one third of the host of heaven to fall with him. I want you to know, child of God, that these angels, oh glory, they were in the presence of the Lord. They were in the presence of the Lord. There was worship like we have not seen yet. But yet still, this Son of the morning was able now to persuade them I don't know what he told them because being in the presence of the Lord what else anybody else could say to you but yet he was able to influence these Spirits, these other angels. And he took one third of the host of heaven with him. If this adversary was able to persuade one third of the host of heaven, who are you and I? We have to be really determined to serve God for the adversary not to persuade us. Hallelujah. We have to be really determined in our mind to serve God. If we are not determined, the adversary is going to persuade us otherwise. And we have been around some time now. And we have seen persons who the adversary has persuaded. And right now they are not in the presence of God. 
They are not serving God. But this adversary, he was able, Lord Jesus, I want us to get it. I want us to get who this adversary is, who it is that we are up against. We live this life on earth right now trying to see the Lord. We want to get there. Oh, I want to get there and see the Lord. Just to see him, just to look upon his face. Dare to see him forever. Half his saving grace. So we're trying everything to get there to see the Lord. But these angels that saw the Lord that were in the presence of God, this adversary was able to persuade them. Who are you and I? Brethren, we have to be careful. Lest when we think that we are standing, lest when we think that we are standing against the adversary, the adversary have us in handcuffs. We have to be really careful. This adversary is not normal. He has seen it all. Been there, done that. He has been tempting men and women from the foundation of the earth. And he has found what works. And he will continue to use it. If you find what works, I remember Bishop Grizzle told a story about um, the, the guys and the band playing the music. And, you know, while the other guys were moving up and down the scale, this guy was just one, one, one string, one string. And they said, what are you looking? How is it that you're not moving? He said, you searching for it, but I found it. So that is why I'm playing this one string. The adversary is playing that one, that one thing. And remember, remember that he has been there, he has done that, he has seen it all. And he will not relent. The Bible says resist him and he will flee, but he will not relent. So when the apostle tells us now, so like I've been saying, of all these angels that we mentioned, only one set did not fall, and that is the seraphims. But everything else, whether it be thrones, whether it be dominions, whether it be powers, whether it be virtues, whatever rank they were of, they fell. And these spirits are what we are up against. So when the apostle now in the book of Ephesians 6 verses 12 says, For you wrestle, Jesus, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. The apostle was saying to us, These are who you are up against. That is why he started off by saying, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Child of God, don't make the mistake and think that your neighbor next door is the person they are influenced by wickedness they are influenced by spirits who want to destroy you don't think that it is the lecturer the lecturer is influenced by a spirit don't think that it is your supervisor your supervisor is influenced mark you the adversary now sees something in your supervisor that him can work on. In order not to get to the supervisor, you know, but to get to you. He wants to break you. Hallelujah. And if you are not strong in the Lord, you recognize why now we go back 
to the apostle now and he first said that we must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh glory. So if you are not strong now in the Lord, him will break you. That is all he's aiming. If he can get you for backslide. If he can get you for be depressed. If he can oppress you. If he can back in and corner now when you say, poor me. Not recognizing that, look here. I am power pack. Oh, glory to God. If he can get you in the corner. Go and break you and go and destroy you. So our battle is not with the flesh and blood, child of God. Not with the co-worker, not with the neighbor. But it with these that the apostle mentioned. Principalities and powers and rulers. Against spiritual wickedness. In high places. Did you know? Did you know that? Satan can put something in the mind of your neighbor. I want us to turn to St. John 13 verses 2. I'm going to show you this, 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 this adversary. Did you know that Satan can put something in the mind of your wife. He can put something in the mind of your husband. You know why your wife accusing you of cheating and nothing no go like that? You know why your husband accusing you of cheating and nothing like that? Because the adversary has put something in their mind. Jesus. Did you know that the Bible tells us that Satan put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus? You think this adversary that we're up against normal? No, you understand why I had to go through all of that to tell you who you are. Because it's not a normal adversary. If this adversary is able now to put something in the mind, he can then poison the mind. He can then bring doubt. Let us look at the scripture. St. John 13 verses 2. And supper being ended, the devil, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. I am just saying to you now what the Bible says, what is written in the Bible. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to what? Betray Jesus. So like I've been saying, the adversary can put something in the mind of your wife and your marriage. You see, if the, look here now. If the adversary, if the, I don't know why God, Holy Ghost, if the adversary can get you to just think one time that your wife cheating, him find the one string and him going play the one string play the one string but a lot of time as Christians we are not living in the spirit we are not led by the spirit so we don't understand what is happening we don't understand that no our marriages is being attacked no my personal life is being attacked no my finances is being attacked but we think is who we can see. Not recognizing now that demons 
These diabolical forces are just lurking, ready to destroy us. Yes, so Satan can put something in the mind of, you know, that this is why we have saints living in malice. Bishop, Bishop, probably will not see. But you're coming to church and you're not talking to your person. To the person. And that is just a simple part of malice, you know. Because in your heart, you're just wishing for something bad. Something malicious. Something bad to happen to the person that you're not talking to. And as a child of God, this is where we are and we come into church. Sunday after Sunday, and we lift in holy hands, worshiping God. So we think, not understanding that you are in a battle. And because you have allowed the adversary to put something in your mind, is one of the wiles too, you know. But you have allowed him to put something in your mind. And it goes a far away. And if you check your neighbor and talk to your neighbor, Nothing don't go like how you think. But this is what the adversary does. This adversary is not an easy adversary. This adversary will destroy you if you play with him. I want you to know That of yourself, you cannot stand up to this adversary. Let us turn to Psalms 8, 4, and 5. Because I want you to know, if you think that of your own strength, you can, you can stand up with this adversary. No, you can't stand up with the adversary. Because you were made a little lower than this adversary. Psalms 8, 4, and 5. What is man? Hallelujah, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him, this is talking about man now, a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with honor and glory. We're not even going in the honor and glory part, right? This word lower means to lack. To lack something. It means that when we are compared with our enemies, when we are compared with these principalities and these powers and these thrones and these dominions that fell, we are made, we were made lower than they were. So when we do the comparison, we realize that they can fly. We don't have any wings. We realize that they can appear. And many times as we go through scriptures, we recognize that the Bible says the angel appeared unto Mary. The angel appeared unto the wise men. They just think about the location and they are there. They can go through walls. We can't go through walls. We are limited. We are visible. But they are not visible to us unless they choose to reveal themselves. So while in the middle of our heated argument, you are not seeing the spirit that is on that side. Tell him your neighbor. Tell him a piece of your mind. You are not aware because of now the emotions. And him can read that too. 
I know that right now, you can just inject something in your mind and cause you to just spill out. And when you finish, you can retract the words. So they are not visible, but they are there. They do not die like us. And like I said, they are wiser. When we compare them, they are wiser because they have been around from the foundation. Satan know everything that will work against you. But he know you from your barn. He is not Jesus Christ alone know you from your barn, you know. Hallelujah. Him, him looking at you from your barn. From the carry to the church and do the dedication. Him looking at you because while Jesus is saying, this is my, he saying, no, this one is mine. He is also able to disguise himself. As the angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing of his ministers also to be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Satan is also able to transform himself as an angel of light. And even those, so many times some people are gravitated to, to, the, to, to, to the ministers that are pushing down some people and slaying them in the spirit. And they are gravitated to some, to some things that they see that these ministers are doing. But the Bible is telling you that the, they are able to disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. And they will, look here, the adversary, the adversary know that some of us in church, you know, and if we ever see a man, just make a man get up out of our wheelchair. We leave a man a bishop daily ministry. You know. We just want to see a man take up a man out of a wheelchair. And then we're gone. The adversary will send such a person. So of ourselves, we cannot stand against these enemy against these four we cannot stand we must be empowered and be strengthened by the lord this is why we need the holy ghost it is at this time we can say greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world i feel a burden from last week that somebody is watching but you don't have the holy ghost I want to tell you that you need the Holy Ghost. In order for you to say, greater is he that is within me than he, these spirits who roam the atmosphere. These spirits who are set up over different communities, destroying souls. If it was not for the grace of God, some of the places that we live, we couldn't even go back there. Because the adversary would want to get you out. Our brother Brown, over by that side. It's the grace of God because the adversary would just want to get him out. And his life is a testimony to those in the community. But we have got to recognize... That we are up against an adversary is a real adversary. And his number one goal is to destroy us. His number one goal is to get our souls. 
we have to remember that God did not give them a chance to repent. And so what the Satan is doing is trying to get as many souls to be condemned and go to hell with him. But I want you to know today, child of God, that there is a real adversary. The Bible said that we must be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. We have to be wise when we're dealing with this adversary. We have to know this adversary that we are up against. And finally, as I close tonight, this adversary, so just as though you are the righteousness of God, you are ambassador of God, you are power pack, you are a son of God, which means that you stand up for everything I should stand up for everything that says God. This adversary is against everything of God. So once you name the name of Jesus, why is he after you so much? Once you name the name Jesus and you are saying what God wants you to say, the adversary is against you. How about it? The apostle says in the book of Ephesians, when he wrote to them, he was now telling them that, look here, there is no middle road. Once you start serving God, you are automatically in a battle. But child of God, don't worry yourself. Because the God that you serve has never lost a battle. And once we remain in him, we will be on the winning side. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Next week now we we'll continue. We we'll get into the wiles. What is the wiles of the devil? And Bishop not too long did something on it and he mentioned. So we'll just want to do a briefly um, talk about the meaning. And then we we'll get into some of the practical things. Some of the things them like tied in we'll talk a little bit about that and, and we'll set certain things straight because some people you might use the excuse that you're not sure how to tie it you know, but I'm going to tell you how to do it I am saving the Holy Spirit is saving your soul I'm going to talk a little bit about the wiles of the adversary might be able to wrap up everything next week but it is according to the will of God. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Hope that you have learned something. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Just bow your heads as I close off in prayer. Father, we again we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the word tonight. We thank you, God, for helping us to understand a little bit more about the enemy and who it is that we are up against. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the apostle said, but against principalities and powers. But we know, God, from the scriptures that greater is you that is within us than he that is in the world. Lord, because you are within us, we are able to overcome the world and the wicked one that is in this world. We pray, God, that you'll cover us as your people with your spirit and that you will hide us underneath your blood. We pray, God, that you will let your will be done and let your will be accomplished in our lives as we go forth throughout this week we pray your continued blessing on us and we pray that you will keep us bless lord every soul that tune in lord whether it be locally lord overseas bless every soul lord jesus and let your perfect will be accomplished in our lives as we try our best to submit to you and we give you thanks in jesus name Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. God bless you one more time. In Jesus' name.